welcome to the Spring Creativity Conference organized by Eli Kramer, to whom I'm going to turn it over in a minute. I'll save my formal introduction of Eli until he speaks, because somebody's got to introduce, introduce him when he speaks, and so uh, that'll happen. Actually, many of the people, if you find yourself curious uh, 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 about anybody you see here, many of these people can be found as fellows of the AIPCT on the fellows page. Uh, uh, and so uh, if you want to know who Charles Herman is, it's right there on the AIPCT page. Now, what is the AIPCT? The American Institute of Philosophical and Cultural Thought was started by me and John Shook and Larry Hickman upon the occasion of the decision of Southern Illinois University Carbondale to defund the Dewey Center. <laughs> so uh, we found that to be an unacceptable decision and have since, the, since 2016. It took about a year to get it up and going. Some of you guys were involved in getting it up and going. Uh, and we've done a lot of stuff since, uh, since we got it up and going. We started in uh, November of 2016. Uh, and if you go to our YouTube channel where all of this is going to be presented, you will see a rather popular uh, channel. Uh, our, our number one video is Barbara Stiegler. She's uh, uh, from uh, the University de Michel Montaigne in uh, France, in Bordeaux. And she has, I think, 4,400 views for her lecture at the AIPCT. Uh, it's quite a wonderful lecture, and there are the numerous others that have been viewed a lot of times, and perhaps these will be viewed many times as well. So that's the reason we're recording our <clears throat> channel. All right, so with that said, we're a not-for-profit institution registered in Illinois uh, and trying to get re-registered with the Internal Revenue Service, 501 c 3 It hasn't been easy to work out the paperwork, but in any case, that's who we are and what we are and what we're doing. Um, uh, and so essentially continuing the work of the Dewey Center, but also broadening the mission. Uh, obviously, COVID has affected us. If you look at our webpage, which is just AmericanPhilosophy.net, uh, I'll put it in the chat here in a second. Uh, if you look at our webpage, you'll see a wide variety of activities. Uh, and in particular, one of the best things we ever did was partnered with the Foundation for the, for the Philosophy of Creativity, because they helped to fund a lot of our programming. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm a member of the board of that organization. It's a fine organization, and I'm happy to be associated with it. You will find that um, website at uh, creativityfoundation.org, and I'll also put that in the chat. This is the third Spring Creativity Conference. The two previous ones are up on our YouTube channel, and so you can, you can watch to see what happened. We did, uh, we did Dewey and Logic the first year, and last year Jared Kimling organized, so John Shook organized that one, and we did last year uh, Jared Kimling, who's somewhere on here, oh, there you are in my lower left, yeah, hi, Jared, um, uh, organized uh, uh, our Spring Creativity Conference around personal objects, and the book is very soon to be out, uh, that, uh, that was drawn from. Uh, some of the, in fact, I think most of what you're going to hear today is actually aiming at a book as well, and that book is uh, co-edited uh, by Eli Kramer and uh, two of my best friends in the world, Martin Richter and Chemek Forstika, um, uh, who I think are with us today as well. And Chemek is going to be speaking as well. Um, uh, and uh, so this Hello. is this is a warm up for a book. There's Martin. Okay, I see that you are you're in you're in the dark. Oh, I guess it's dark in Poland. Oh gosh, <laughs> it's already dark there. You guys are so far north. All right. Anyway, uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. So I'm I'm going to now turn it over to Eli to begin the proceedings. We got three papers this afternoon, and I'll just turn it over to him uh, and let you let him tell you about the conference and about our first speaker. Uh, first, I just want to thank the AIPCT and the Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity for supporting this event. I also want to thank our co-sponsors the Department of Philosophy of Culture of the Institute of Philosophy of the University of Warsaw, uh, our ongoing uh, partners between SIU and them, uh, as well as IDOS, a Journal for Philosophy of Culture, and the Center for Philosophy of Culture of the uh, Institute of Philosophy of the University of Wrocław. And uh, excuse me, I should say the Faculty of Philosophy. They no longer share that uh, with the University of Warsaw. Uh, they no longer share their institute or their faculty with the uh, social sciences. Uh, real quick, just a, a general introduction of where this event emerged and the book that we are preparing and is under peer review. Uh, in the summer of 2019, we ran an International Philosophy of Culture Week 
which led and really built off a series of discussions about the role of philosophy of culture, what it is, how, what it does, what, where it's going. And then a second theme emerged, of course, which is the creative capacities of culture, which was probably an ongoing theme for both all the participants and ongoing discussions that happened afterwards. So the pieces you're going to hear uh, that are presented, some are from the book, some are from ongoing discussions related to the book, and some are just really uh, new stuff developed out of our ongoing dialogue. Uh, so I uh, again want to thank anyone involved, and I am uh, very excited to introduce Professor Zofia Roshinska from the aforementioned uh, Department of Philosophy of Culture at the Faculty of Philosophy at the University of Warsaw. Um, Professor Roshinska is uh, uh, the actually one of the was basically took on the role of leading the um, philosophy of culture department there from Stefan Morawski, and she did that for 25 years. She engages with problems that arise at the meeting point between psychology and philosophy. She introduced psychoanalysis to the Polish philosophical scene as a method of reflecting on culture and the human person. Recently, she works on the possibility of dialogue between philosophy and psychiatry. She is the author of many books, uh, which if you want to look at them, we uh, list them on the AIPCT website. Um, and if we had a Socrates, as I like to say, of our ongoing philosophy of culture discussions, it certainly has been Professor Roshinska. Um, and to celebrate her birthday and all the work she's done, the last issue of Eidos uh, was made in honor of her about methods and practices of philosophy of culture. So with that, uh, that said, I'm very excited to introduce Professor Roshinska to give her paper today, um, uh, Dialectics of Creativity According to Władysław Strozewski. Thank you very much for the introduction. I, I didn't realize that I deserve such a wonderful introduction, but thank you very much. Dialectics, <clears throat> dialectics of, creative, of creative work according to Struzewski. Struzewski is a Polish philosopher. He's, he's still alive. He's around a 90 right now, and he lives in Krakow. <clears throat> The category of creativity and the phenomenon of creative work are subjects that have their own permanent place in the philosophy of culture. Also, they are not always intensively analyzed. These subjects continue to hold great importance as they did for Plato, Bergson, Freud, Jaspers, and many others. Creativity continues to baffle philosophers questions about the psychological and social conditions of its possibility, whether subjective or not, have shrouded it in mystery. Also answers provided by philosophers have shed some lights on creativity. They nevertheless failed to turn it into the, an issue that could be settled through inquiry because of an unexplained reminder always linger behind. The 1960s and 1970s abounded in writings devoted to creativity. For example, Arietti, Birdsley, Elsenberg, Gilson, Heidegger, Timieniecka, and many others. Polish language texts, both literary and philosophical, are often suffused with this question. For this reason, I would argue that it is high time to reconsider the mystery of creativity. Thus, I am grateful for the opportunity to address this topic. And in this place, I would like to say thank you to Peter Wozniak. Peter Wozniak is American student who is right now in Faculty of Philosophy in Warsaw University. And he helped me with my English. And also we discussed the paper a little bit. So Peter, thank you. As my contribution to the discussion, I wish to elaborate on the book Dialectics of Creativity by Struzewski, which was published in Polish in 1983 by the publisher who focuses on publishing 
about music. The aim of this study, as the author puts it, is, quote, to foreground the ontological basis of creativity and in indicate the dialectical character of the creative process, unquote. Artistic creativity in the focus of Struzhevsky's inquiry, artistic creativity is the focus of Struzhevsky's inquiry. As he argues in methodological terms, his approach is closest to phenomenology, which means that eidetic accounts rooted in direct experiences of artists dominate over other forms of description. The author sets out to examine the nature of creative phenomena and the possible relations between them. Quote, in the course of studying the creative process, he writes, we shall attempt to identify its essential aspects. However, they shall be considered as idealizations without setting whether each of them has to be actualized in real creative process, unquote. In the following paragraph, he adds that if we could discover and analyze all of its crucial features, as well as all possible relations between them, it would become possible to develop a range of models describing creative process. Still, difficulties posed by carrying our research, by carrying out research on the basis of direct experience, do not leave much room for optimism. In his book, Struzhevsky brings together two areas that seem rather distant from each other, phenomenology and dialectics. He achieves this by overcoming a static understanding of essence in favor of a dynamic account that bases on contradictions. This was made possible by grounding his theory on statements obtained from exceptional artists and creators of culture. It is by supporting philosophical inquiry on direct experience. Struzhevsky's innovant, innovant, innovativeness is also strongly emphasized in the way he combines and reconciles methodology with axiology. Taking direct experience as his point of departure and analyzing statements made by great artists, he observed a close connection between the artist's methods and axiological needs. In many cases, he discovered an authentic longing for values that motivates creative activities. Struzhevsky's intellectual efforts can be regarded as an attempt to achieve synthesis, specifically to combine the material with the spiritual. What facilitates this synthesis, according to the author, is the artistic creative process. All novelty can be thus understood as a stage in the process of satiating the artist's axiological appetites. The thesis about the presence of value in culture does not raise doubts, but questions regarding the hierarchy and origin are intrinsic to axiological inquiry within the philosophy of culture. Combining values with creative activity and novelty opens a new intellectual area. In order to satisfy the axiological hunger for values, artists reveal them through their creative efforts. The first part of the book 
offers a semantic analysis of concepts employed by Struzewski, especially dialectics, creative process, and product as well as creative personality, predisposi predisposition, or certain special trait that allows one to engage in creative work. The author focuses particularly on the creative process or the kind of activity that leads to the creation of something new, something that did not exist before. He begins with definitions drawn from Plato's sophist. Quote, he who brings into existence something that did not exist before is said to be a producer and that which is brought into existence is said to be produced. And every power which causes things to exist not previously existing was defined by us as creative." Unquote. He also draws attention, I mean, Struzewski also draws attention to subtle differences between several words in Polish that mean to create. There are three words, tworzyć, stworzyć, and odtworzyć. Tworzyć means to make something out of an already existing material, while stworzyć means to create something from nothing. Indeed, in Polish, and in English, God is called Stwórca, the creator, while an artist would be called Twórca, creator in the former sense. Although we do speak of great works of art, for example, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony or Michelangelo frescoes in terms of being Stworzone, created in the divine sense and not Tworzone, created by a human being. Finally, odtworzyć, to recreate, means to reconstruct something that was destroyed or to imitate something else. For Struzewski, the key category is dialectics, which he understands more broadly than Hegel. The term derived from the Greek adject adjective dialectikos denotes the skill or art of dialogue or a method, for example, of division. The verb dialegestai, derived from this adjective, means to belabor, discuss at length, and analyze. Socrates is considered to be the creator of dialectics, although some attribute its invent, also some attribute its invention to Zeno of Elia. According to Xenophon, Socrates argued that dialegestai is the main method in philosophy since it involves gathering together, exchanging views, conferring, and making important distinctions. While seeking the essence of the creative process, Struzewski adopts the Hegelian understanding of dialectics as a process that permits the entire reality and allows one to learn about it. Depending on how we understand reality, we speak of it in terms of the dynamic development of either spirit or nature. Assuming that the cognitive process must be adapted to the object of cognition, Struzewski, who deems his own intellectual cognition as dialectic, actually supplements Hegelian dialectics with a Socratic approach involving phenomenology and hermeneutics. Drawing on direct experiences of artists, he also provides ample evidence of his own beliefs and interpretations. Thus, dialegus hai contributes to his search for the essence of the artistic creative process. 
Consequently, Struzewski regards the creative process as dialectical and argues that his own method must be dialectical as well. In his view, the dialectical character of the creative process means that all its aspects revealed in inquiry, there emerge contradictory moments or forces, and it is only in their tensions that we can glimpse vital elements of the entire process. These clashes may vary in character and intensity, but invariably bring forth something singular and new, never appearing in isolation. In Struzewski's study, the dialectical character of the creative process and the search for its key features boil down to analyzing statements made by selected great artists who have made self-conscious observations in private letters or public declarations regarding the course of their creative process. Direct experience can be called an artistic confession. However, it wouldn't be a way of complaining about various psychological or physiological ailments, but a mode of offering testimony about a, the creative process. In the sixth chapter, <clears throat> titled The Dialectics of the Creative Process, The Question of Oppositions, Struzewski characterizes 10 oppositions identifiable in the creative process. The te determinism and necessity, consistence and unpredictability, domination and submission, spontaneity and control, directness and indirectness, freedom and rigor, improvisation and calculation, acceptance and rejection, innovativeness and perfectionism, creating and discovering. These oppositions are dialectical insofar as they occur within the same single whole and belong with it. This is important. In Struzewski's perspective, the creative process is conscious, while creative self-awareness is its integral and crucial component since it manifests in all psychic acts connected with creativity. In a nutshell, inquiry concerns here the di dialectical moments made conscious by the creative subjects while identifying the vital contents and conditions belongs with the dialectics of creativity. Struzewski was inspired to seek opposition within the creative process by Henry Moore, who noted that, quote, good art has contained both abstract and surrealist elements, just as it has contained both classical and romantic elements, order and surprise, intellect and imagination, conscious and unconscious. Both sides of the artist's personality must play their part. And I think the first inception of a painting or a sculpture may begin from either side. As far as my own experience is concerned, I sometimes begin a drawing with no preconceived problem to solve, with only the desire to use pencil and paper and make lines, tones and shapes with no conscious aim. But as my mind takes in what is so produced, a point arrives 
where some idea becomes conscious and crystallizes. And then a control and ordering begin to take place, unquote. The first opposition, that of determinism and necessity, introduces categories that provide a gateway to crucial philosophical and anthropological aspects of creativity, especially of the artistic kind. They are connected with artistic freedom and its conditions. According to 17th century theoretician of painting, Federico Zuccaro, quote, the mind of the artist should be not only clear, but free. His talent should be free and not hampered by mechanical submission to rule. For this most noble profession, for this most noble profession has to base its prescriptions and the norms on good judgment and practice in order to be well done, unquote. Good judgment and practice constitute the basis for rules and norms chosen by the artist. What we thus encounter here is freedom, but not arbitrariness. Struzewski also introduces the category of an axiological a priori, which belongs to the world of necessity or the domain of ideas and values, the world of spirit. Determinism, on the other hand, belongs to the world of empirical facts. Both spheres, that of the spirit and that of the senses, are active in the creative process. Factors that determine, that determine the creative process originate in the world of empirical facts. It is material resistance, pre-existing binding rules, or the taste that predominates in a given culture. As Struzewski argues, these factors may meet with either approval or protest. In the case of former, the resulting work is well made in craftsmanship terms, yet remains derivative and conventional. It may be appealing, but not truly awe-inspiring. When that which is given meets with protest, artists seek fresh norms and materials, longing for new values and horizons of meaning. What emerges in the desire to discover and what emerges is the desire to discover and reveal them. Many assert, Beethoven claimed, that every minor piece must end in the minor, nego. On the contrary, I find that in the soft scale, the major third at the close has a glorious and uncommonly quieting effect. Joy follows sorrow, sunshine, rain. It affects me as if I were looking up to the silvery glistening of the evening star." Unquote. Witold Klutosławski also held that the range of musical instruments in a typical orchestra is inadequate for the expression of modern musical ideas. Likewise, certain painters abandon some of the tools that were in use for centuries, while sculptures introduce techniques that facilitate surprise, surprising new effects. Beyond Beyond the rejection and acceptance of what is given, Struzewski distinguishes a third possibility, one that involves 
what making restriction a means of discovering meanings and values, unquote. What is given ceases to be imitated and, and is rather continued in the sense of being deepened and perfected. Perfection consists in realizing those possibilities that are inherent in what is given, but haven't been fully brought out yet. One example of this is Kandinsky's approach to freedom and necessity in art. He was convinced that the only artistic law is principle of inner necessity, which has three components, the artist's individuality, the style of the period, and the everlasting rules of art. The first two are subject to change. Quote, only the third component, the true artistic and everlasting one, remains alive forever. It doesn't falter with the passage of time, but benefits from it. Unquote. The predominance of the third component, Struzewski insists further, is a sign indicating the greatness of the artwork and the artist. Unquote. Thus, artists must devote themselves, thus artists must devote themselves to the third component of inner necessity, attempting to find it within themselves, in their own spiritual life. As Struzewski concludes, quote, measure and significance are not found outside artists, but within them. They constitute what may be called an artistic sense of boundaries, something innate to artists and elevated through inspiration to the heights of a prodigious rela relation, unquote. Okay. In his discussion of Bach's 12th tone, Kunst der Fuge, Anton Weber writes that art of Fuge is based on a single theme. Bach wanted to show all that he could, that could be extracted from one single idea. Practically speaking, the details of 12 note music are different, but as a whole, it's based on the same way of thinking." Unquote. Adherence, Weber argues, is strict, often burdensome, but it's salvation. We couldn't do a thing about the dissolution of tonality, and we did not create the new law ourselves. It forced itself overwhelmingly on us." Unquote. The moment of axiological necessity can be also discerned in determining, in determining restricting factors. Importantly, Weber claims that the new law forced itself overwhelmingly on us. What would that mean? Can the idea of inner necessity be regarded as a constraining factor and not a desirable one? In Struzewski's view, this possibility emerges when a value loses its power on significance and the new, stronger value ought to replace it. However, this regards lesser values since the highest ones never lose their importance. This is well illustrated by in Garden's observation about relations between aesthetic and ethical values. Moral values, moral ones, demand realization, while aesthetic ones 
beg for it. The former being stronger than the latter. What? An art that departs from necessity arising from meanings and value, Struze and values, Struzewski argues, loses its identity. It may naturally become something else, activity, production, even begetting, but not art, unquote. A similar sentiment is expressed by Harold Rosenberg, who writes that, quote, the artist who has left art behind, or what amounts to be the same thing, who regards anything he makes or does as art, is an expression of the profound crisis that has overtaken the arts in our epoch. Painting, sculpture, drama, music have been undergoing a process of de-definition. The nature of art has become uncertain. No one can say with assurance what a work of art is, or more important, what is not a work of art. Where an art object is still present, as in painting, it is what I have called an anxious object. It doesn't know whether it is a masterpiece or junk. Okay, um, so how much time I still have? Randy? Um, uh, so this session ends at 12, I mean, at 1.30 our time. What is it there in Poland? Is it 7.30? 8.10, 8.10. 8.10 So this session ends at 8, uh, at 8.30, Sophia. But there is a little okay. give, there's a little give in the schedule. Um, uh, so if, if there's something important that you need to go on and say, then by all means say it. Uh, otherwise, we could move to uh, discussion. I think you've said a lot of really interesting things for just my opinion. Yeah, but 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 see, I would like okay, if, if you would like me to finish, then I, that's okay. But I have two. Oh gosh, I have three, so I don't know. Maybe no. I will. Maybe I will present submission and domination. Is it okay? Submission and domination. Okay, I don't. Know. So, so maybe actually, not. Okay. Did, did you, do you have a section on improvisation and what was the other dialectical pair? No, I have uh, spontaneity and control, submission and domination, freedom and rigor. So I prepared three, four. Mm -hmm. Oh, you didn't do the improvisation one. That's the one I want to hear. Okay, no, just whatever <laughs> you think. Yeah. No, I have it, but not here. I, I, okay, so, okay, so I don't know. Uh, maybe five more minutes for me and then 15 minutes for the discussion. That sounds great. I okay? think that will work. Good. Okay. Okay, so submission and, 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 and domination. These are attitudes do not refer to the formal aspects of the creative process, but define that approach to the material out of which a work is made, to inspiration and to one's own feelings. Many artists express their fulfillness to the material, faithfulness, sorry, to the material. As Michael Angelo famously wrote, the best of artists never has a concept. A single marble block does not contain inside its husk, but to it may attain, only if hand follows the intellect, unquote. A similar idea was expressed by Henry Moore. Every material, quote, has its own individual qualities. It is only when the sculpture works direct, when there is an active relationship with his material, that the material can take its part in the shaping of an idea. Stone, for example, is hard and concentrated and should not be falsified to look like a soft flesh. It should not be forced beyond its constructive build to a point of weakness. Submission is opposed by domination and a empowered approach that believes in its own concept and ideals without nothing that existence of another transcend, 
without noting the existence of another transcendent reality. Guided by its own ideas and methods, this attitude rejects inspiration or intuition. Still, submission and dominance alternate, not clearly distinguishable, and only displaying a different distribution of accents. This opposition is be best exemplified in interpretation of music, where three attitudes can be identified. First, there is mechanical interpretation. Second, virtuoso interpretation. And the third, ideal interpretation. Uh, okay, mechanical interpretation with the performer playing only that which is contained in the score. Though this verges on the impossible, it is often postulated. According to Igor Stravinsky, idea of interpretation implies the limitations imposed upon the performer or those which the performer imposes upon himself in his proper function, which is to transmit music to the listener. The, the idea of execution implies the strict putting into effect of, a, of an explicit will, will that contains nothing beyond what is specifically commanded. Second, there is virtuoso interpretation, where the score acts as a pretext for revealing the artist's technique, emotions, temperament, taste, etc. The audience is thus fascinated not by the work itself, but by its mastery execution or original interpretation. The composition, possibly either shining with new light or being caricaturally distorted. The third ideal interpretation would harmonize the work with its performance. According to Struzewski, this is feasible only when an intimate or almost mystical compact is established between composer and interpreter. The genius of the former shall never be grasped by a mediocre performer. As a pianist, Wilhelm Backhaus admitted he would prefer his audience to admire the sonata itself rather than his own performance of it. Okay, few, okay, no, 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 the, the last. Harold Rosenberg's book was published in 1972. Struzewski's book, a decade later, in 1983. Is the creative process different half a century later? Are there any new models or definitions of art? As Struzewski notes, I repeat, an art, I quote, that departs from necessity arising from meanings and values loses its identity. It may naturally become something else, Acti activity, production, even begetting, but it ceases to be art, unquote. Would it mean that, for example, Artur Zmijewski is in fact not an artist, but an activist? The 50-year-old multimedia artist and key representative of critical art has been expanding the boundaries of art beyond what is deemed artistic, arguing, arguing that art is primarily about thinking, participating in collective life, reacting to social problems and dissenting. Several years ago, he was hired as Kunstfeind, an enemy of art by Der Spiegel not only because of his ambition to transcend the boundaries of art, but also because he would reveal its weakness and dependence by arguing it can be re revived and empowered through political engagement. This reopens the debate on the end of art. Struzewski's theory attempts to prevent us from endorsing the view that the art is indeed declining. Thank you. Getting your claps. Um, I, I'm going to open it up for questions. Uh, you'll, I think you can see people are people do it with the mute to not uh, overcrowd the sound here. But um, 
Uh, for questions, we I will have uh, just for people to know, Peter and Shemek will help with translation if need be. But uh, if you have a question, I think you can open it up and I'll I'll field them. No questions. <laughs> there are a lot of questions here. <laughs> Give them time. It's baking. Okay. So my question is, do you think we can use these categories of opposition to interpret the practice of philosophy as art? <laughs> it's a very difficult question and very serious question. I don't, I don't know how Struzewski would answer this question. I, I don't know really. Uh, uh, Laura, I don't know. I don't know how to answer. Maybe someone helps. But uh, as a matter of fact, why not? <laughs> why not? I, I have a follow up then. Do you consider philosophy as uh, art in this way? Or does it fall into this, you know, other, does it slip into this other category, says in the activity and other things? Does it do this? Uh, dialectical attentive reconstructive work by your own standards. No, but uh, I refer Struzewski and I am thinking how he would answer it, okay? And I think it is very difficult question for him. Uh, and I don't really, uh, hmm. okay, because he based his research on uh, direct experience. Will you find any philosopher who could say and could claim that he is an artist or that he that his theory which he made is work of art? Probably he would answer in this way. But I have to ask, I have to write down your question because I would like, I, because I have to, I have to report to him everything <laughs> what happened here. <laughs> this right. philosophy work is philosophy. Great, great question. I have a uh, question. How would I answer personally? I have a question. I, uh, well, I think uh, uh, Professor McCreel has a question. If you're uh, okay with that, Sophia, we'll hand it off to him. Uh, you talked about the inner necessity of a work of art, and but then you gave some other ideas that were associated with them. But I didn't I didn't follow that. You said something about individuality. I think could you could you expand on that a notion? Of inner necessity. Yeah, yeah, but but okay, okay, but the inner necessity, uh, of course, is composed. Is composed. Uh, is composed. Can I say yes? I can. Is composed of three elements, but the most important is this. What what, what okay? What is? What are those three elements? What is really? You went through them so fast, I didn't hear what those three elements were. I know, I know. So I will read again. Okay, I will, I will, I will read again. Okay. Okay, three components. Three components. The artist's individuality, mm. the style of the period, uh, and the everlasting rules of art. The everlasting but what? Individuality. The everlasting oh, okay. what? This everlasting rules of art. The rules of art, I see. That doesn't sound like inner. Everlasting necessity. rules of art. And only the third component, everlasting rules of art, remains alive forever. I don't understand what I know lasting, you can laugh at it. I don't understand what everlasting, the everlasting always lasting of art have to do with inner necessity. He claims it does. Maybe mm -hmm. can you give a summary again of what he means by in that sense about okay. my understanding okay, so was 
Yeah, like, uh, go ahead and read again, and then maybe I'll provide some summary. Well, Rudy's question, can you hear me? Perfection process. Rudy's question okay. is, has, is, how do the rules of art, how is that a component of an inner necessity? necessity. Because it seems external to the inner. It seems like universal. What's the inner, what's the inner about it? I, I, if, uh, well, the other yeah. two make sense. So, so that's enough. No, no, I understand. I understand the question because they are exactly my questions also. So I don't really, but, but, but listen, this is the axiological a priori, and this is the most important for Struzewski. And this axiological a priori is what we have inside, if, if you are an artist, what we have inside, and we, uh, and, and the content of it, it changes, but the desire for values, the desire for spiritual values, or that doesn't matter what kind of values, is always present in, in, uh, in, in, in artists. And then beyond the rejection, okay, uh, what is given? Okay, similar again. One example of this is Kandinsky's approach to freedom and necessity in art. He was convinced that the only artistic law is principle of inner necessity. This is Kandinsky, but Struzewski accepts it and likes it. And he has, I mean, the inner necessity has three components. The artist's individuality. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Individuality is, it's artist's individuality, it's obvious. Yeah, yeah obvious. Yeah. The, the style of the period, yeah, that because makes we sense. live in, in certain time. Yeah, that's a historical and, individuality, right? Yeah, and the everlasting rules of art. Nobody knows exactly what is everlasting rules of art. Mm -hmm. But yeah, okay. Lindy, nobody knows. That's where you lost it. That's where, that's where Strzewski lost it. I mean, <laughs> no, I think that's I don't think so. because Rudy's point is that's where that's clearly where the rest of us have to get off the. I mean, how is an inner necessity? No, I don't get off there, Randy. Oh, you would. <laughs> oh, yeah. As a yeah. Why I are can, you laughing? I don't yeah. understand your laugh. Yeah, Why are you laughing? Because well, because, because he knows I'm a jazz sax player. And as a jazz sax player, when I'm improvising, there's and something doesn't work artistically, there's and it, it's in the style, like I'm playing in some contemporary style, but I but I feel that it doesn't work. And what I and that feeling comes from within me. And the reason it doesn't work is there are universal rules of art even within okay. they apply to jazz improvisation just like any other art form and i can feel when something is not right and that's inner that's inner yeah. feeling of these universal okay. rules of okay. art Martin, if, help. if i may Martin, help. <laughs> no no Martin can't but, help but wait you. no 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 Martin is position and he, he knows is going to be your enemy in this <laughs> Professor Roshinska, I remember from one of our previous discussions, I liked how you responded because I brought up the same concern with you and you said that um, if you are a good artist, you know what this means. You know what it means to have this <laughs> third true. component. That's true. No, but, but see, but in jazz player, there is a kind of harmony, even there are dif differences, isn't it? Well, uh, and, and sure, uh, it depends on what what, what jazz uh, we are talking about. There is free jazz, and uh, in that case, it would be more complicated, probably. Yeah, but still, within free jazz, there are things that work, and there are things that don't work, right? Mm -hmm. No. I mean, a lot of young players, they think free jazz means you can play whatever you want, and there's there are no criteria for whether it works or it doesn't work. But that's young players. They they mature beyond that. 
Well, so wait a minute. Thought... Would, would you call me a young player, Ralph? <laughs> no, I no. I've no. played together a number of times, and I and I just profoundly disagree with you about. It. So, I mean, have you ever heard of found sound? Uh, uh, I mean, in the course of improvisation, what doesn't work the first time around can in work can work the second time around because of your your very insistence upon it. Well, then you're uh, already acknowledging that there's a difference between what works and what doesn't work. And isn't that part of the dialectic no. issue here, that the inner necessity is the drive of what works and doesn't? No one knows what the universal rules of art there, but they are there in the, like, it works or it doesn't work, even if it changes the next time. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, I, I can say that. The reason it's internal is that you feel it within yourself, whether you feel well, that makes it. Sense. Oh. Yeah. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. This is exactly how he thinks. And <laughs> yeah, of course it is. But the argument is phenomenological. Yeah. And there's yeah. Uh, and, and 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 the thing of the thing about it is is that's not the kind of claim that Strzhevsky's making. It's not a phenomenological claim. He's claiming there are everlasting rules of art. I know no, 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 what no, no, I'm no, no, feeling no, no. when I know it doesn't work is that it violates those everlasting rules of art. Professor Roshinska, you were going to finish. Maybe we'll have you close out on this uh, interesting theme here. Uh, what do you think of it's Randy's claim? I, no, no. I... Oh, what the were you going to say? Wendy. It is, Randy, it's process. It's never, it's done immediately once. It is the process and he based on direct experiences of the artists who are self-aware what's going on in the process of creation. And this is the phenomenological approach. Why not? Sophia, when I'm improvising, the self disappears. There's nothing to phenomenologize. It just, it's gone. That's the, that's the glory of improvising is that, is that it erases the internality of the self. There's no, there's no phenomenological, I mean, R Ralph is saying, believe me, he and I have argued about this for 35 years, <laughs> but there is no, there is no, self to refer to when the improvisation is taken as the creation that it is. It just doesn't work that way. It may work that way for Ralph, but I'm surprised because he's a really good no, musician. No, I would not, no, of course I'm not thinking about myself when I'm improvising, but it's okay. myself, but it's myself that is doing the thinking and the feeling about what I'm improvising. <laughs> We have been arguing about that for 35 years, but I would say, therefore, it's not an inner, I'm going back to Rudy's question, it's not an inner necessity, it's just some kind of necessity. It, you could call it axiological necessity, if you wanted to. Oh, All right, so a, I'm, misbehaving. I'm misbehaving, Eli, you should rein me, you should rein me in. Quickly. I was about to do it, but uh, maybe, uh, Pro Professor Roshinska, <laughs> do you have any final thoughts to finish us your session with, and then we'll uh, move to the next. Question is the question is art exist or not? If, what what do you mean? Give that My a little. Question, I I expect that someone answers for me because so I'm I think, really confused. I think their question is: Does a self exist in artistic pras praxis? So, like, if you're doing if you're you know, playing that solo or your piece of music, right? And yourself, there is no self because you don't feel it, it's not present. Uh, but that is that really inner necessity? The fact that you're not focusing your attention on it, you're not self-conscious. There's a difference between a self and a self-consciousness. Yeah. You're not reflecting on yourself, but it's yourself that is thinking or feeling whatever it is that you're thinking right. or feeling. So Actually, I think the mm -hmm. you, may, you may even consider uh, musical activity, activities as uh, a form of uh, forming your subjectivity in a certain way. It brings up um, a certain mode of sub subjectivity, right? So, oh, yeah, so that's it, true. Yeah. Well, this is a great discussion, but we need, okay. we have lots of other things to get to. So, I, uh, 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 we'll, say, we'll, we'll continue it later, but uh, let's give another round of a, uh, applause for Professor Roshinska. Thank you for a great talk. Thank Might be silent much. applause. <laughs>